Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy we're all gathered here in this cozy bookstore, which is my neighborhood bookstore, to do some reading. And this is interesting because it's the final event in Ithaca Sounding 2020, which has been a four-day festival this weekend. <coughs> As someone who's really interested in literature, pretty much whenever I'm reading something that's not for work, I'm reading novels uh, or short stories. And as a pianist, I accompany lots of songs, uh, which for the last um, maybe 15 years was how I got access to some of the greatest poetry ever written uh, in many different languages. Um, and so through that, like a kind of love of poems grew. And so in the context of this festival, which is celebrating the music by Ithacans um, from the last 80 years or so, um, it was a real pleasure and surprise to discover that Anne Silsby was actually better known as a poet than a composer, even though her music is also really very wonderful. Uh, so I, I knew I wanted to do something <coughs> involving her poetry, and the fact that David Borden has been writing these very fun and interesting memoirs that have yet to be published, I hope they'll be published at some point in some sort of collection, and then my friend Adam Tendler has published two books that are really fascinating and, and beautiful that I came to read over the last year. It kind of just seemed appropriate that this event sort of be our cozy little capstone to the weekend. Um, so after a weekend of, of thinking about music and talking about music in the academy and experimental traditions and having five separate concerts, it's really lovely now to actually relish in the music of the written and spoken word. Uh, so I'd like to welcome to the podium David Borden. I'm going to read the short essays from my collection called Sound Bites, and I started them maybe 10 years ago. I wrote a couple, and then uh, I don't write these a lot. Uh, so I have seven or eight of them. And I'm thinking of keeping going. Uh, I have been sort of not writing anything for two years. I've had a series of cancer operations, and now I'm cancer-free. I didn't have to do chemo or anything, so I'm fine. I'm okay. Um, and this starts, they start with, uh, uh, I'm starting with the, uh, an essay called The Piano Thing, which I thought was appropriate for, and so did Richard, for the piano things we're doing. And it discusses... Uh, very early part of my life, so. And I come from a very poor working class neighborhood and a poor working class family and with great parents who uh, supported me all the way through my uh, education, so. Uh, during my very early years in this incarnation, 1939 to 1943, as I was coming into consciousness, one of my earliest memories was hearing my father practice the piano in the next room while I was in my crib. He repeated phrases from various pieces over and over, perfecting the fingering, dynamics, phrasing, and etc. Among the composers were Liszt, Chopin, Beethoven, and Gershwin. There were others, including Ragtime, but they weren't revisited as often as those four composers. Of course, as a child, I had no idea what any of it was, but I believe this was my early ear training and it gave me perfect pitch. All of this occurred on the third floor of a three-family house on the street with several other three-decker homes in working-class section of Brookline, Massachusetts. And by the way, Brookline, Massachusetts doesn't have working-class sections anymore. It's, it was known as the wealthy towners then, but it was divided between the servants and the, you know, the re more wealthy. One of the families had 13 children, but the families were Irish Catholic with mostly three, three to five children in each family. The neighborhood's unofficial name was Whiskey Point. My father was a busboy and bouncer at a restaurant and bar in Scully Square, one of the toughest neighborhoods in the city of Boston, since torn down for a new government center. My mother was a salesgirl at Woolworths in Coolidge Corner, Brookline. 
My maternal grandparents also lived with us in this five-room apartment. As an adult looking back, I wonder how so many people could have lived in harmony in such a small space. The rooms were small, there was no hot water or central heating. They kept, to keep food fresh, we had an ice box with a large chunk of ice in it that drained into a large pan on the floor. Mr. Amendola would haul the ice on his leather protected back up the three flights of stairs every third day or so, along with a bag of coal. We didn't have a refrigerator until after the war, World War II. The only stove was a large iron black monolith in the kitchen that burned coal. To take baths, my mother boiled large pots of water to mix with the cold water in the tub, and so, of course, there was no shower. I remember in the winters I would wake up in my freezing room and make a beeline for the kitchen where my grandmother, Mother Mallard, incidentally, Mallard being my mother's <laughs> maiden name, would be waiting with orange juice and toast next to the warm stove, and all of my childhood friends lived in similar arrangements except for the grandparents. Instead of siblings, I had an extra pair of parents. So this way of life was perfectly normal for all concerned. The one thing we had that seemed out of context was the piano. It was an upright, but nonetheless a piano. Nobody I knew had a piano except one older woman my mother knew, and it was not playable. Sometime shortly before I left Brookline, to study at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, my father told me how we happened to have a piano as I was growing up. My parents were married during the summer of 1935. Neither of them had any education beyond high school. Neither of them had any money. My father had been an orphan since he was 14. My mother's parents had been servants with no education beyond the eighth grade. When my parents got married, my mother my mother's father was ill, so they agreed to live all together until he got better. It turned into a lifelong arrangement. Although they had no money and lived in cramped quarters, they naturally wanted children. And I have a little question mark in parentheses. It's like that. <laughs> after, after several months of trying out but not getting anywhere on the pregnancy front, my parents sought help from doctors, wondering if there was some medical problem that prevented them from having children. After countless tests and trying intercourse at times when my mother's temperature was slightly higher and other methods of natural impregnating, nothing happened. This went on for almost three years. They then assumed that theirs would be a childish marriage, childless marriage. Uh, during this time, they had saved $300 toward the expense of childbirth. There were no health care plans available then like there are now. $300 was a lot of money in the Great Depression. My father made only $13 a week and my mother made less. Every day on his way to Scully Square, my father passed several music stores. He had had a few piano lessons as a young boy and knew how to read music. He loved music, but the 50 cents for lessons had proved too much for his parents to afford. He noticed that one store had an offer that appealed to him. If you bought a piano with cash from a certain group of pianos, you would get a year's free piano lessons. The piano teacher was also an employee of the store and demonstrated various classical pieces on the piano. My dad-to-be talked this over with my mother. Since they had $300, the exact amount for one of the pianos, he could use this to fulfill his dream of really learning the piano because they couldn't have children. It would be another way to accomplish something positive. My mother was already involved in artistic pursuits of her own with oil painting and watercolors, so she was sympathetic and agreed. Soon the upright piano was delivered to the tiny apartment and my father got the lessons. He was so good that the story used him as an example of what could do, one could do in a short time starting late in life. He and his teacher agreed to play Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue at the store on two pianos with my father playing the solo part and his teacher the orchestral accompaniment. He kept getting free lessons as long as he helped demonstrate the pianos. He also kept his job as busboy and bouncer. <laughs> this, three weeks after the piano was delivered, my mother got pregnant with me. <laughs> I always tell people that I refused to come back to Earth until they got the piano. <laughs> Karmically, I knew that these were going to be my parents, but they just had to get that piano. I must have it must have been a deal we all worked out beforehand. 
By the time I uh, started piano lessons in the first grade, one dollar a lesson, I recognized pitches by name even when I wasn't the one playing them. I thought everyone could do this. This was 1944, and by that time my father had found a job working in a machine shop that fabricated parts from, from munitions. He ended up having a lot of minute medical, I mean, minute metallic particles embedded in his fingers that became painful when he tried to play the piano. So after I started, he would only occasionally play himself, but would always be eager to help me with my lessons. After the war, he earned his living as a janitor. When it was obvious that I needed a better piano teacher to make pro progress toward a professional career, he returned to the same Boston music stores he used to pass on the way to work during the Great Depression. He asked each sheet music department which piano teacher bought the highest quality music. He got the same answer at four out of the five stores. The teacher charged $10 an hour, which is like $150 an hour these days. Instead of compromising on the piano teacher, he took an extra cleaning job, in addition to his several other part-time jobs, on his night off cleaned out a donut shop for five bucks. He talked the piano teacher into giving me 45 minutes instead of an hour for 700, I mean for 750. Uh, Albion Metcalf was one of the very best piano teachers in Boston. He also taught at Phillips Academy, Andover Academy, and had gone to Harvard. I was in blue blood territory. My father never told my mother how much the lessons cost because he knew she would veto the idea. He didn't even tell me until after I received my first college degree. When my parents retired to sunny Florida, my father pursued his horticultural interests. He, had a, he did a lot of strange things. He grew the strangest trees and plants I ever saw and created a fancy landscape design around their house. He would only occasionally try out Gershwin at the piano on the same piano. He died in 1982, and when my mother passed away in 1998, I had the piano delivered to my nephew in Tampa, who was receiving lessons on it as I write this. When preparing their Florida house for sale, the real realtor hired a landscape company to come and, and keep up the lawn, etc., to help the sale of the house. When I met the landscape guy at the door, he peered around the front of the house and said, this is the most interesting collection of plants I've ever seen, very rare stuff. Uh, very rare indeed. So that's that one. And the next small essay is about Stokowski, who I really didn't know, but I sort of knew him by reputation and having seen him in Fantasia. In Fantasia, he was, he was sort of uh, an animated character who, sh who shook hands with Mickey Mouse in the middle. And I talk about that. But my father was always, when I started piano lessons, he would, t he would try to get me interested in, in, in various composers and, and how, how the whole world worked and how pianists became successful. He, I always remember he took me to see, um, I can't remember, he's a very famous pianist, and after the concert at Boston Symphony Hall, he said, do you know what just happened? And I said, yeah, he played one of the pieces I'm working on. He said, no, no, no. He said, he made $5,000. <laughs> Tchaikovsky. Not long after my first piano lessons, my father bought children's books about music and read them to me. He always encouraged my interest in music. For Christmas, also my birthday, he gave me children's editions of composers' biographies, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. This was 1944. I had just turned six. He also had recordings of music by these three composers. I especially liked Haydn's surprise symphony and the story behind it. He also took me to movies that he thought would pique my interest in music. In 1945, he took me to see Anchors Away with Frank Sinatra and Gene Kelly, although his main reason for taking me was so that I could see pianist and conductor Jose Aturbi at work. I remember that he thought it was extremely funny that the Sinatra character mistook Iturbi for a piano tuner. But what I loved most was the animated sequence. Gene Kelly danced with Jerry the Mouse. The dance began with both of them walking on a red carpet toward us in the audience. It ended the same way, but with more exaggerated movements. 
As a kid, I thought they were going to walk right into my seat. The next year, 1946, Dad took me to see the re-release of Fantasia, the Disney production that featured animations set to classical orchestral music. I loved the whole thing except Tchaikovsky. As a kid, I had playtime records of Tchaikovsky and I really didn't like them and have never warmed to his music. The scene that struck in my mind was, though, was Mickey Mouse walking up to the podium and shaking hands with Tchaikovsky, who conducted the score. This scene was done in silhouette. I think I like seeing the human figure interact with an animated one once again, like Gene Kelly and Jerry the Mouse. Leopold Stokowski was, along with Toscanini, the most famous conductor of the first half of the 20th century. When Fantasia was released in 1940, he was already 58. By the time I saw it, he was 63 and had recently married 24-year-old Gloria Vanderbilt. Fast forward 13 years. In 1959, I was a student at the Eastman School of Music. Stokowski was scheduled to conduct the Rochester Philharmonic and had also agreed to meet with the students in the student lounge. He had just returned from a tour of Russian guest conducting with major orchestras. He was now 77 and no longer married to Gloria Vanderbilt. <laughs> he showed up at the lounge filled with students in an upbeat mood, slim and energetic, although he, his lined face and white hair revealed his age, his eyes were full of mischief. The lounge was rather small and funky, with a few couches and chairs. Most of the students either stood or sat on the floor. The place was packed. After essentially narrating a stand-up comedy version of his recent concert tour of the Soviet Union, he started to wind down and take questions. But before he could do so, an extremely loud screeching noise suddenly erupted from the back of the room. A student unable to enter the lounge from the front due to the entrance being blocked by so many people had taken the underground tunnel that led to the lounge's back door. The door was hardly ever used, so when it was forced open, it made an ungodly sound. Stokowski, momentarily taken aback by the interruption, soon regained his composure and started taking questions. I had been waiting for this moment because I had what I thought was a great question. He called on various people and they all asked basically the same thing. What did he look for in prospective instrumentalists when holding aud auditions for vacancies in the orchestra scene? Uh, that was it. As he was in the middle of answering one of these variations on the same theme question, the door at the rear was again forced open, making an even more ear-splitting sound than before. This time, Leopold lost it. At the top of his lungs, he screamed, confound that squeaking door. His face turned red and projected an expression of pure rage. I suddenly understood how he had capacity to control a hundred piece orchestras peopled with virtuoso egomaniacs. He was a force to be reckoned with. Needless to, stay, needless to say, the questions became much more hesitant and the crowd never fully recovered its earlier enthusiasm. I definitely was not going to ask him my planned question or any other one either. Soon the meeting broke up. The next morning I got up early for an eight o'clock class and the walk to Eastman from the dorm took me past rundown stores and bars on Main Street. The alleys in between were home to the few guys working, drinking from containers and paper bags. Up ahead was the featureless gray street that ran along the back of the Eastman Theater and led to the rear entrance of the school. As I turned left walking onto the empty street, Swan Street, the drab vanishing point ahead of me erupted out, of, uh, out onto East Avenue. It became more colorful in a, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, uh, chiaroscuro. <laughs> I, I've never actually had to say that word. <laughs> kind of way by a figure in silhouette who suddenly appeared there walking toward me. The length of two city blocks away, all I could make out was the long top coat, very fashionable in the 1950s. Then the long scarf, the white hair, the gait. It was him, steadily inching toward me, or more accurately, we were inching toward each other. It was like a pathetic version of high noon. <laughs> As we got closer, I began thinking that it might be possible to ask the question that I had prepared for him the day before, but then I vacillated and decided it was a bad idea. But then again, I was flip-flopping all the way 
God, he was just a few yards away, then a few feet. I blurted out, Maestro, I had a question for you that I didn't get a chance to ask yesterday. His eyes met mine. I think they were gray, maybe blue. These eyes said to me, kill, die, hate. <laughs> Find a hole and disappear. Even so, I detected a slight slowing down of his pace, so I said, aren't you the only human being ever to shake hands with Mickey Mouse? He kept walking past me, his tempo a little slower. I watched him. He turned back toward me, continuing to walk. This time he was smiling. His right hand shot skyward, still smiling. Yes, the only one. And he kept on walking down away from me, head held high. I thought he must be looking for breakfast. It made my day. <laughs> so are you ready for one that's a little longer than? Yeah. Well, I know, but I, I, I don't know where to do that. He said I could just read part of it. OK. This one's called What's in a Name, and I, in my whole life I've always been fascinated by names. And then I discovered anagrams, and, and I have a series of pieces called Anagram Portraits also. And I also thought, well, you need to see the name. So when, you, when I mention a name in the anagram or a name, try to figure in your mind what it looks like with the letters and everything, and, and maybe it'll be better. I don't know. As kids, after learning our own names and those of our friends, we tend to take them for granted. But years later, as expecting parents, names once again come into focus. These days, most parents know the gender of the unborn, making the list of names shorter. During childhood, many of the kids we knew acquired nicknames. My own neighborhood, the names are very col colorful. Rubber Nose Burke, <laughs> Flathead Flaherty, Boogie Campbell, Cuckalegs, <laughs> Phantom <laughs> Kelly, to name just a few. And some are really bad. My mother, um, <laughs> my mother named me David because she was the name of one, that was the name of one of the chi children she babysat for in high school. In the 1950s when I was in high school, I fell in love with modern jazz. As I collected more of the records, I became used to how many players had nicknames. Dizzy, Bird, Muggsy, Satchmo, Spider, Count, Duke, Bag, Sweets, Cannonball, Zoot, Prince of Darkness, and so on. My first jazz piano teacher, Ray Santisi, was known to everyone as Muzzy. Sir Shaloff, the great baritone saxophonist, called him Nose. In 1968, when my wife Trudy became pregnant, we started thinking of names. We both intuited it was a boy, so we looked for male names. Both sets of prospective grandparents disapproved of our choices. One night we went to see Far From the Matting Crowd with Julie Christie and Alan Bates. In the opening scene, Bathsheba, Christie, calls out over a beautiful green field, Gabriel, Gabriel. <laughs> at which point, Trudy and I looked at each other <laughs> And that was the name we chose and didn't tell anybody about it until it was on Gabe's birth certificate. <laughs> My perception and understanding of names, choices, and meanings changed after that experience. When we are searching for something important in our lives, relevant things present themselves. Composers throughout history have used their names as sources of, for notes called musical cryptograms. Bach used his name in several places, most famously the last and uncompleted piece in the art of the fugue. Few for three voices, and in German, B capital B equals B flat, and H equals B natural. A and C are pitches without any need of translation. Most of us have musical pitches embedded in our name. S C H A S or E flat in German. C B A are the musical pitches from the last name of Robert Schumann. He used them in parts of Carnival, his multi-movement piece for piano. Dmitri Shostakovich used the D from his first name and the first three of his last to form the pitches D, E flat, C, B, a recurring motive, motif heard in many of his pieces. In the 1970s, I composed pieces for synthesizer ensemble based on the, and called C-A-G-E in honor of John Cage. Pauline Oliveros also used these pitches in her piece for John Cage. In the early 1980s, I came across an Edgar Cayce reading I'll, I'll explain that. 
uh, that offered an explanation of sorts as to what our name implies within the context of our evolving life. I have been a student of his reading since 1959 after undergoing a paranormal experience that I'm sure saved my life. This particular reading states that our current name in this incarnation carries a certain vibration, frequency, that is recognized by the creative forces of the universe. Our name in this time and place is one of a series of names and incarnations which together form a signature frequency separate but for, from but relative to all other entities. This reading also asserts that our name was not given by chance. I know this sounds far-fetched to most of you reading this or listening to this, but over the years I have come to trust the readings. Most of them deal with physical illnesses. I have applied the various treatments to my own body when apropos and everything I've tried has worked. In 1982, I composed a continuing story of Counterpoint Part 2 and dedicated it to Nurit Tillis, which is a strange name. Nurit had been part of my neglected uh, 1981 album called Music for Amplified Keyboard Instruments, which was reissued in 2015 on Spectrum Records label to many positive reviews worldwide. Nurit is one of my favorite keyboardists as well as a good friend. Most of the Counterpoint series is for synthesizers, but part two is for two pianos. The late Edmund Neiman was Nurit's partner in the two piano team Double Edge. They performed this piece many times internationally. Both Edmund and Nurit also performed as part of my ensemble, Mother Mallard, as well as with Steve Reich and musicians. Since Nurit Tillis is such an unusual name, it piqued my newfound interest in how names originate, and I decided to do her anagram. Her name yielded I Trill Tunes, which is musically appropriate. In 1984, I decided to surprise her with a piece for two pianos using that anagram for a title that Double Edge could, form, could perform if they chose. Altogether, Nareet liked the piece, but she didn't like the title. So I came up with an idea. She could play piano one as a solo, and I would call it by her other anagram, The Little Ruins. <laughs> This worked, but they occasionally performed I Treat Trill Tunes. Also, this was the beginning of my anagram portrait series. A year later, in 1985, when the personal computer revolution started, I bought my first Mac and soon discovered a free anagram app. I found anagrams for names of composers that were uncannily apropos. Arnold Schoenberg, Angel Born Chords. <laughs> Also, Berg's Channel Door. <laughs> so his music contained otherworldly pitch combinations, and he was Alvin Berg's teacher and mentor. Dmitry Shostakovich. Christ, I'm okay, avoid this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm historic, hits vodka. <laughs> and Eric Satie, Raise Kite. And Satie's best music seems to float in the atmosphere. Pierre Boulez, pure bile, zero. <laughs> and this seems unduly harsh. Boulez was a tireless champion of new music, founded Earcom, but still I never liked the way he rebranded John Cage's chance and interdeterminacy. And he called it aleatoric music as if he invented it. Morton Feldman, mend tonal form. And Feldman used traditional instruments without radically changing the way they are usually played. He invented entirely new tonal timbres that unfolded in a serenely beautiful way. Igor Stravinsky, no gravity risks. His ostinatos always rooted his music on terra firma, no matter what else was going on. Howard Hansen, whoosh and ran. <laughs> Hansen was the first American composer to win the Prix de Rome, 1921, and in George Eastman in 1924, gave him a lot of money to start the Eastman School of Music. And with Eastman's financial windfall, Hansen ran. He ran with it and established one of the best music schools in the world. And my favorite, John Milton Cage. You have to use his middle name for this. John Milton Cage. Oh, menacing jolt. <laughs> And from the 1940s until his death in 1982, Cage's music, ideas, and books revolutionized the way music and sound was perceived and practiced to the chagrin of academia. 
And I know, I was there then. I was fortunate to know him and proud to call him a friend. In uh, 1989, can you, are you okay for more? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> in 1989, Ivan Cherepny, the founding director of Harvard's Electronic Music Studio, contacted me and asked if I could contribute a piece for a concert honoring Leon Kirshner's retirement from Harvard. We had both been in his composition seminar at Harvard in the 1960s. I agreed and started to think of what I could do. I decided to make a piece using synthesizers and samplers. Ivan said that if the Ivan, we, you, he answered to both. Ivan said that if the piece was not for acoustic instruments, he would just play a recording. This is what happened. Remembering how well some of the anagrams work for names, I fed Leon's into the anagram application. Out came her inner lock, which had a nice feel to it. So I later wrote a little note to him saying that he had helped me, helped open music's inner lock to me when I was a student. After working on it for a few days, a strange thing happened. My brother, who was a locksmith in Boston at the time, was sent to Kirshner's house to replace all the locks in his house due to a recent burglary. This was a classic example of Jungian synchronicity. <laughs> Jung coined this term to express the concept of a causal connections of two or more psychic and physical phenomena. Having read much Jung during the 1970s, I simply accepted this and moved on. In January of 1991, I read of Julius Eastman's death in the Village Voice. The obituary, written by Kyle Gann, was almost a year late. Julius died in May of 1990 before he turned 50. Eastman, an old friend from Ithaca, was found on the streets of Buffalo, New York, on the verge of starvation, and he died shortly afterward. I immediately had the impulse to compose a piece in his memory. His anagram turned out to be unjust malaise. So I composed an anagram portrait for the two pianos which was premiered at Lincoln Center out of doors in June of 1991 by Double Edge. These two words describe Julius's condition perfectly. In his early 40s, he was evicted from his Soho apartment for failure to pay the rent. His belongings, including his scores and papers, were thrown in a dumpster. And at that point, he began living as a homeless person in Tompkins Square Park. His downward spiral continued when he succumbed to drugs, alcohol, and a general feeling of hopelessness. It was, this, it was as if his anagram was a synchronistic warning. Several years after his death, New World Records asked me if they could use my title, Unjust Malaise, for their title of their two CD set of his music. I agreed, and when the recording was released, New World sent me a few copies. I had the pleasure <clears throat> of delivering one to Francis Eastman, Julius's mother. After this, I paid much closer attention to how these how some names actually contained anagrams that even fit the person perfectly or in specific cases activated some kind of related but acausal phenomenon. Ellen Hargis is a great soprano and world-class musician who was in my Mother Mellor band in the late 80s and early 90s. Her name reveals Hell, a singer. <laughs> Stephen Cole, my late friend and Cornell colleague in the Department of Performing Arts and Media Arts, had a heart replacement. His anagram is the multilingual open lure chest. When my son was born, Trudy and I were dumbfounded by his bright red hair. Ours was dark brown, now it's white, when we remembered that both of our mothers had red hair. Gabriel Borden, belaboring red. The noted musicologist and world-renowned organist, also a current member of Mother Mallard, David Gaynor usually yields daily organs every day. I continued to compose anagram portraits. Among those most memorable are for Richard Stoltzman, Lou St. Dennis, Ted Sean, and, and Diane Ackerman. In the late 1990s, I got to know the great clarinetist Richard Stoltzman when he visited Cornell and gave a concert with the Emerson String Quartet. His anagram is Christ, Mozart Land, which is appropriate. His performance is a recordings of Mozart's quartet in A major for clarinet and string quartet. Kershaw listening 581 are definitive, as are his other recordings of Mozart. During this period, I was composing pieces by using entire instrumental parts from already existing pieces and comp composing new environments for them. 
This idea was influenced in part by Bucky Fuller's definition of synergy. Synergy means behavior of whole systems unpredicted by any of their parts taken separately. Other catalysts for this approach were certain paintings by Roy Lichtenstein based on other paintings, most notably his series of paintings that revisit works of 20th century painters like Picasso, Matisse, and Carlo Cara. My late friend painter George Deem based much of his work on painters from history, especially Vermeer. The process is not just mixing styles, but has a much deeper implications. It touches on the concept, I hope I get this right, coni unctionis, which is a Latin word for joining together. Taking an entire part from an existing piece of music and combining it with a new set of musical elements is more like the Jungian approach to alchemy. It's a tra transformation of musical substances that were born in entirely different eras and morphic resonances. This synthesis negates neither, but combines to form a third entity. While listening to, in rapid succession, Mozart's K581, first movement, is vastly different from Christ Mozart land, which incorporates the exact same clarinet part from the first movement. I am somewhat startled by this myself, even though I brought it about. Predictably, predictably this idea was anathema to Richard Stoltzman. This came as no surprise due to his history of perfecting the performances of a recognized masterpiece. He thought I was just having fun by messing around with one of the Mozart masterpieces. Other clarinets also disliked my piece for the same reason. This convinced me that I was on the track of something very interesting and meaningful. <laughs> I have continued this practice off and on since the early 1990s. It's not an easy process and I retired my first attempts, but starting with Christ Mozart land, I knew I was onto something special. I have a history of working with modern dancers and choreographers, and when I was in graduate school at Harvard, I performed The Incense with Ruth St. Dennis in 1965. I was 26 and she was 86. At the time, I had no idea about her historic role and influence on modern dance in America. In 1915, she and her husband, Ted Sean, formed the Dennis Sean School of Dance and Related Arts in Los Angeles. Among their students were Martha Graham, Doris Humphrey, Lillian Powell, Charles Weidman, Jack Cole, and silent film star Louise Brooks. Meeting and working with her at Radcliffe made a lasting impression on me, but it wasn't until 2007 that I composed some music based on Ruth St. Dennis and Sean's unique dance movements, thanks to Norton Owen, director of preservation at Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival in Great Barrington, which was started by Ted Sean in Massachusetts, I obtained the festival's collection of Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean DVDs. Using these and other sources, I studied their choreography and creating creative music, not by trying to match individual choreographic images, but by trying to capture different characteristics of their work and letting the video artists match the movement to the music. I hired some really good video artists match my music to their DVD movements, and it worked out beautifully. The titles of the music tracks were anagrams of their names. Rue St. Dennis, Third Sunset. Ted Sean, The Dawns. And it was another example of how names can reveal an otherwise unknowable connection. They elicit the iconic images of Queen of the Night and the Sun God. Diane Ackerman, author of the bestseller The Zookeeper's Wife and Other Wonderful Books, lives in Ithaca and is a friend of mine. Her anagram revealed Naked American. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I composed her anagram portrait. After working on it for a week, Diane received a call from a local group trying to raise money for the local school for music and arts. Their project was producing a calendar that featured nude photos of local women. <laughs> she accepted. And I finished my piece, Synchronicity and Relevance of Various Kinds Continued to Dog My Enneagram Projects. In 1994, Cornell awarded composer Steve Reich Cornell University Alumni Award for Distinction in the Arts. They asked Steve if he could come to Ithaca and present some kind of musical performance. Steve and I have been friends since 1970, and he knew I was on the music faculty. He said he would do Piano Phase, his minimalist masterpiece from the late 1960s, for two pianos, if I could come to Manhattan and rehearse with him for a week. This was arranged, and Steve and I practiced 
piano phase every day for a week at the Baldwin Piano Store. We got into such detail that it sometimes sounded like a lyrical piece from the Romantic era. <laughs> I drove us back to Ithaca. On the way, we discussed many things about how the scene had changed since the, since the 1970s. Eventually, I told him about my anagram portraits and how I had considered doing one for him, but decided against it. And he asked why. I told him that I didn't want him to get a horrible skin rash. <laughs> His anagram is severe itch. He nodded in agreement. And that's it. Thank you.